Hey everybody, it's Pastor Louis Giglio, and I'm so excited that you are joining us today for this amazing conversation. The idea today is that God wants you to know that you can actually change the way you think. Obviously, uh, me and my guest today are going to lean very heavily on the reality that God gives us the power to change the way we think, but the end result is this, that you're not stuck with the negative depressive, anxious, worrying, toxic, bitter thoughts that are rooted in your mind. God is giving you the power to actually change the way you think. So welcome to the conversation. I have two amazing friends uh, joining today. And honestly, neither one of them need an introduction. Jenny Allen just led the IF gathering a few weeks or so ago. And I'm guessing there were millions of people linked together around the globe at this event, not just women, because we're in a virtual world now, so guys can sneak in to the IFT gathering. But she's an amazing leader, uh, incredible author, New York Times best-selling author. Her book uh, that we're going to talk about today a lot is Get Out of Your Head, which I'm um, thinking a lot of you have seen or heard of or read. And then, of course, Craig Rochelle is the leader of leaders, and I'm so honored to have you on today, Craig. His book that came out just in February is called Winning the War in Your Mind. And this came out of a series, I think, that you did at church a few years ago around anxiety. But Craig is the leader of the largest church in America. Uh, that church gave birth to the Uversion app that almost all of us probably used on our phone at some point today. And in addition to that, he is the current champion of the Global Leadership Summit and a stunning author and just an incredible person. So welcome, Craig. Welcome, Jenny. I'm so glad you guys are part of this conversation today. And I know people uh, have linked in because they really want to hear, how can I change my mind? I'm in a pit of depression, a spiral of anxiety. I've got all this negativity going on in my mind. And here's the thing that blew me away. Jenny, in your book, you actually say, I've got little tabs on the pages. I was going to read it in your own words, but you say for an 18-month period, you were in a hole and yeah. you, were, you were questioning everything. In fact, you say right here in your book that you got to the point where you were asking the question, is God real? And I'm like, yeah. what? This, Jenny Allen wrote this. This is Jenny Allen's book. Jenny yeah. Allen is asking the question, is God real? And I just... I think that's gutsy, and I, I respect you for writing what really happened. And then, Craig, I'm reading your book, and you talk about a time in 2019 where you were in the hardest season of your life, and such that it actually encouraged you at some point to reach out to a counselor. And I'm like, Craig Rochelle wrote this. Craig Rochelle's talking to somebody? And people know my story, knows me, knows I had a big mental collapse uh, about, a decade, uh, about a decade ago and didn't think I was ever going to come out of that hole again. And when I was in that place, I tell people this and they kind of say, oh, that sounds nice. But I'm saying, no, 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 I'm not just telling a story. I really thought I was losing my mind. Mm -hmm. For a season of life, I thought I'm going totally crazy and I'm not going to ever come back again. And you guys have been in that place. So let's just start today by talking about that place and talking about how God let us out. Well, I love that you're starting here, Louie, because I feel a little bit like I got invited to the cool kids club. So I, I appreciate that as leaders that are leading beautiful movements of God, we're being candid about this because so many people feel alone. And I would say in that season of 18 months where I was questioning my faith, I definitely felt alone. I think it was strategic of the enemy that I did feel alone. So I was sitting every night, 3 a.m., I was waking up in the night and I was wrestling with questions like, is this real? Does it fade to black? There weren't other options. I didn't feel like it was other religions. I feel like Christianity was it if there was a God. But this humanistic you know, approach to life was creeping into my mind. And, and so I walked through that season for 18 months and I end up having a pretty intense anxiety battle with death. And, and it was, to, to make it a little lighter here, I, I actually realized how bad it had gotten when I was watching a Marvel movie. And I'm sorry if I'm about to ruin this for you guys, because if you haven't seen it, it's been out for years. So 
shame on you because I love Marvel and you should have watched all of those. Um, but I'm watching the second to last um, part of the series and, and what happens in that is a lot of the superheroes, uh, they turn into dust and they evaporate. Well, I, I had to leave the theater. I had such a strong reaction to watching Spider-Man evaporate. And it was this feeling of this is just what happens. Like we live, we die, and it's not going to matter. And and when I had this strong reaction, my husband said, what is going on with you? And, and I started to notice that I had really gotten into this place of, of doubt that was taking a toll on, on everything in my life. And so I finally admitted it to one of my good friends, um, Ann Voskamp, some of y'all know her, and, and we were in Uganda. And she looked at me and grabbed me by the arms and said, you do have faith. You have been under spiritual attack. And I, I start laughing. I'm like, obviously, I was under spiritual attack for 18 months. But it never occurred to me. It never occurred to me. And that is mind-blowing to me that I sat alone in the dark with the devil for 18 months and really let him say whatever he wanted to me. And, and that eroded my faith over time. So, I mean, I'm coming into this conversation with really just a zealous heart. And I'm so grateful for both of you men who have the same heart where we fight for people because it's not okay. First of all, nobody that's feeling anything is alone. We're all spiraling universally right now, right? COVID proved it. We're all universally a bit anxious. And so I get excited that this really could be a turning point, hopefully in the church, where we start bringing people in. And just like I, I said to Anne, this is where I've been. Hopefully this will be a catalyst for a lot of people to, to bring other people in to this struggle. Yeah. And Craig, you've experienced that because I know when I began talking about battling with depression and anxiety, it was like a floodgate opened around me of people saying, A, I can't believe you're saying that out loud in front of people, and B, thank you because I'm in that struggle. And I was clueless a decade ago as to what people were up against and how dark it really was. And when I fell into that hole of depression and anxiety, um, I didn't think I was coming out of it. But when I did start coming out of it, I started understanding how many more people were in it. And I know you hear people say that all the time. Thank you for being honest about your anxiety. Yeah, I, I wanna just say also thank you to both of you. Uh, Louis, your transparency and your book, I'm so glad it's coming out and so glad that, that you wrote it. It's, um, you, you just, you go to a place that a lot of people wouldn't go to and, and I think it's gonna help so many people. And Jenny, I can't remember the exact time frame but I was writing Winning the War in Your Mind and yours was out and somehow I got it. I read the first chapter and I just put it away. I'm like, I am not gonna read this. It's so good, I'll end, <laughs> I'll end up copying it. And so I waited until I was finished writing the manuscript to go ahead and back and read your book. And your story is, it's, 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 it's just so honest and it's so incredibly helpful. And so to since we're all fellow strugglers, a little bit of my story, uh, it snuck up on me in, in 2019. I, uh, like, I think I've, I've now learned it happens to a lot of people, but I just um, was going, going, going way, way, way too hard for way too long. And my body kind of shut down. What was odd is there was um, about a two week period on the back side of it, I looked back and I almost didn't remember anything that happened during that time. I just had v almost no memory whatsoever. And I realized I was kind of in, you know, I was in a real place of trouble. So I called around, got some referrals and found a performance psychologist. He's in a different state and he works with people that need a lot of help. And so I just kind of submitted myself to his care. And what was interesting is the first place he started to go, even though physically I was a wreck, he wasn't treating me physically. He, was, he started treating me mentally uh, and really looking at where my wrong thoughts um, and lies that I'd believed for, for years led me into a productive, um, an outwardly productive um, lifestyle, but an inwardly destructive one, meaning my thoughts could lead to good production, but they were destroying me. And so we really got into, it's kind of you know painful, all the stuff of the past, but digging up, where do I have root beliefs in my mind that are, that are lies of the enemy, they're inconsistent with God's truth. And even if they bring about a good result, the result is compromised because it's, it's not a God honoring belief producing that. 
And uh, it's, so it's been a process. I still work with them today. And um, in, in my mind, if there's anybody who says, you know, why would you know, a leader like Louie or Jenny or Craig, why would, why would someone like you work with a counselor? I would say it's wise for anybody. If you're an athlete, you get coaching. If you're you know, in, in entertainment, you go to classes. And if you're in life, why not get wisdom from people that are um, wiser than us to help us grow spiritually, especially when it comes to retraining our minds toward truth? Yeah, absolutely. And we might have time for a question or two today. So if you want to put a question in the chat, not sure if we can get to a lot of questions, but we might can get to one or two. And I also want to let you know that we're trying to resource you today. So I have a new book coming out next Tuesday. It's called Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. This book, along with Craig's book, these are all such great resources. And, you know, I held them up on this little video that I did yesterday and not knowing that we were all coming down this road. And I just went, I think God's trying to say something to people. Yeah. And I think that it's time for us to let him help us win this battle of our minds. And so uh, right now, if you've got two devices or after this conversation ends in about an hour from now, we're offering for two hours all three of these resources for $25. So that means it's costing us, I think, for, to get you these books. So we're not here trying to sell you something. We're trying to resource you with something. Passionresources.com. All three of these books for two hours for $25. And they're running a special on this book with the hashtag no seat. So you, you'll find that also on there uh, for $10. But Jenny, you said it. And I want to go back to this moment um, about a decade ago. Uh, Shelly and I had come through a hard season. This wasn't my pit of depression and anxiety. It was sort of some fruit of just planning a church and the struggle of what that means. And we'd come through a long season. And some things have been said, some things have been done, and you know, you never forget those little things. And you want to be vindicated, but you don't want to defend yourself. And some months had passed, and something happened that, in a way, vindicated us. And I got some news, and I was like, I got to share this with somebody, because when you get news like that, you do not keep it to yourself. You want to commiserate with somebody. And so I reached out to a friend who'd walked through this whole thing with us, sent him this long text. I'm in the older demographic here today. It took me a minute to compose the text. I send them the text. I'm waiting at the top of our driveway. I'll never forget it, to get the reply. And I just wanted, hey, that's great. I'm so glad it all resolved, and it all worked out. And look, you know, all these things kind of come out in the wash. And that's what I was looking for. And when the text came back, it was nine words. And Jenny, you mentioned this just a minute ago. And the nine word text I got back was the title of this book. So I can't even take credit for the title. The text said, don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Mm -hmm. And I froze. And I realized that for the last season of life, I had let the enemy just pull up a chair in my mind and I'd been talking to a killer, to my adversary. I'd been carrying on a conversation with him. So Jenny, talk about that. Talk about when you realize yeah. who it is that's behind this process and what, what's the first step when that happens? Louie, when I saw the title of your book, I thought, yes, like this is the problem. And, and it's specifically, let's look at 2 Corinthians 10 because this is what Paul says about it. This is the passage where take every thought captive is found in the Bible. But a few lines up from that, he's talking about this war that we have in our mind. And it says, verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. And we're not fighting a fleshly war. Now, medicine, counseling, all three of us have, have thankfully, you know, experience with that. And we're not part of the church that says, hey, just trust God and, and believe that you can be healed. You know, there, there's this sense of these are tools that God's given, right? But what Paul's really clear about, and I think where actually we have more room to grow now, because I think counseling and medicine largely is more accepted now. We have more room to grow in the fact that this is a spiritual battle yeah. and that we don't realize there is an enemy and he is after us. And what a profound place to get us then. I mean, it's private. He can say whatever he wants. Um, I love your imagery of table. He just comes on in and, and, and honestly, for those 18 months, I didn't even fight back. And yet Jesus is so clear in John 8, he describes him 
him and he says um, that this, this enemy, he is a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar. That's barely a verse and four different ways he says, the enemy is a liar. And yet you're exactly right, Louis. We're letting the enemy just say whatever he wants to us. And, and I think I look back at that season in my life and I don't believe that I had shame that I was struggling with that because I'm a pretty open book person. Like I would tell you right now, like what I'm struggling with today, but I didn't think it was a big deal. I don't think I realized what a big deal that middle of the night moment was and how it was actually affecting me and, and eroding my faith. So that's my, my plea with everybody. And I know both of your pleas as well of, we've got to take this more seriously. Yeah, we've been saying this, all three of us, in different ways, and there are a lot of other voices too, but if you are in this conversation, somehow this came across your social feed or somebody told you about the conversation today and you said, I'm just going to give it a chance, and you're in a dark hole, yeah. all three of us want to say the same message to you. We're going to break it down into different ways today, but we want to say you are not alone. Mm -hmm. You are not the only person who has thought that you were going crazy. You're not the only person who thought you were going to lose your mind. We're not the, you're not the only person who's been in that dark, isolated, incapacitated place. And the second thing I want to say to you is you're going to make it. Yeah. The enemy is telling you you're not, but your shepherd is telling you you are. Psalm 23 says he doesn't lead us to these valleys. He leads us through these valleys. And you need to hear that today. I know you're saying, hey, Louie, that's not going to help me today. I need something better than a nice little pep talk platitude. No, this is gritty. This is people who survived. You're looking at three people who, who lived by the grace of God through the darkness. And you're going to make it through. And that's what we're here to help you do today. We're not experts on anything other than the fact that we know that God can bring you through. And so, Craig, what's the, what's the step one? Somebody realizes the enemy's lying to me. Um, I'm, I'm buying into some of the lies. Uh, what's step one for them to start a process of change? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And it, you know, that is step one. I think you have to recognize, just like what Jenny said, is the devil is a liar. And that's, that, that's his greatest weapon, is to try to convince us of something that's not true. And so what do we know? How powerful is the mind? Um, anything that we say that sounds self-help-ish, it's not self-help-ish when you recognize that God created the mind. Great. And, and we know that, that your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. If your thoughts are God-honoring, they're gonna take you to the places that God wants you to be. The problem is we're all vulnerable to our spiritual enemy to try to tell us what we're not, what we can't do, uh, why we don't measure up, why we're dirty, why we're unforgivable, why God couldn't love us, why, um, why we'll never make a difference in life, why we don't matter. And you know, the list goes on and on and on and on. And so when you recognize there's the lie, I would just, just give it a name and you have to clearly define this is something. And what's, what's interesting is if you've believed it for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, uh, you may not know it's a lie. You may just absolutely and completely think that is true. And you have to recognize so much of what drives us um, are, are lies from the enemy. So you define what it is. This is not true. Then what I like to do is I like to find a spiritual truth, you know, something from God's word and counteract the lie with it. This is what the word of God says and take the verse over and over and over again. And what I wanna do in, in my own life, what I've done is I try to take the truth and put it in a statement that I can say over and over and over and over again. And the reason is this isn't positive thinking, this is renewing your mind. Scripture says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, who is the devil. He is the little G, the small God of this world, but be transformed. Now, how are you changed? you're changed by the renewing of your mind. And so if I've believed a lie for a long time, I wanna take a truth and I wanna declare the truth over and over and over again. And what we're doing scientifically to the mind that God created is we are developing new neural pathways. Science tells us, and it's true according to God's word, that the more often you think a thought, the easier it is to believe that thought. And so if we thought a wrong thought for a long time, we tend to believe the lie. Uh, we can't just tell ourselves sometimes one time, well, that's not true, this is true and believe it. So we have to really work to renew our mind, 
God's word is the most powerful renewing agent. And so I want to renew my mind with truth. And Louis, I wish I could tell you, you know, I did that for a week and now I'm better. But there are, there are some lies that I, I've been working five years on renewing and I'll make progress and slip back a little bit, progress and slip back. But step by step, day by day, by God's power, word by word, he, he can renew our mind and whatever, whatever bondage you are, whatever, whatever you're believing, you're not good enough, you won't measure up, you're full of shame, God can't forgive you, God won't love you, you, you don't matter. You know, that's a, that's a lie. And then, then what's the truth? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm God's workmanship. I'm created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for me to do. I'm an overcomer by the blood of the, I can do all things, whatever it is, you take that and then we're gonna start working consistently, faithfully declaring truth to renew our minds. I think that uh, one of the biggest lies probably is the lie that somebody's hearing right now, which is this isn't gonna work for you. Mm. You know, the enemy, he's just got a, uh, a closet full of these lies and some of them are sneaky. So somebody's listening to you right now, you're talking about renewing your mind and they said, I've heard that, but that's not gonna work for me. And that might work for everybody else, but it's not gonna work for me. So you have to start with that lie. I can't even get to the lie because he's already telling me that there isn't any help for me in the lie. Jenny, you, uh, you talk about this and then you have a lot of these uh, diagrams. And this one, I don't know if people can see it or not, but it's four boxes over here on the page. And the boxes are kind of what Craig's talking about. And Craig, I'm like you. I read Jenny's book a little bit later than everybody else. And after I read it, I just went, uh, why did I write a book? Okay. Um, in the, th the first box says, grab the thought. The second box says, diagnose the thought, take it to God, and then make a choice. Talk about those four boxes for a minute. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually focus because I think, Craig, that was good because that really is the question, right? What's true and what does God say about it? But the last box was the one that got me, right? That was the one that I still struggle with is, am I going to choose to believe God? Like, am I going to make the choice to change? And back to that same lie, Louis, that you're saying everybody right now is questioning. It's true. I look at my life and I probably knew if you ask me, um, do you have power over your thoughts? I probably would have known, take every thought captive. Yes, scripture says I do. But I never applied it. I never knew how to fight back. And I don't think I chose to believe the truth about God. And I love your imagery, Louis, if there's a table and God's, you know, those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, let's assume he's at the table too. The Holy Spirit indwells us. He's with us. Um, we have the word of God, the power of God through the Holy Spirit. So we would all nod at that and say, yes, God is with us. The enemy is there lying to us. We know that he attacks those that love God. We don't get a pass after we trust Christ that the enemy's now going to go bother someone else. If anything, it heats up the more we follow Jesus. So we've got the enemy at the table. We've got, we've got God at the table. And then I would say that that other, you know, seat of just having people at the table that can say, hey, look back at God. Like, don't go this way. You know, I picture the devil and the, and the, um, and God, you know, here kind of fighting for us. And, and the greatest piece to me that has caused the dominoes to fall in the correct, or correct direction is just the people of God fighting for me. And, and I really believe that, that we don't need to be intimidated. When I look back at that season that for 3 a.m. wake up calls and all of that time period that I was waking up and, and somebody even said that's kind of the witching hour and they, they you know, told me all this dark stuff around it. At first I got overwhelmed and scared. I thought, you know, to use your, your title again, the devil has a seat at my table, what? You know, like that's who was waking me up and talking to me at 3 a.m. And it scared me and overwhelmed me. But then I realized, gosh, that choice of what, do, what does God say is that, that, you know, I mean, just go to 2 Corinthians 10, that, that there are weapons that destroy strongholds, that we don't have to actually feel paralyzed, that we can move to the offensive position and we can actually fight back. And these weapons that God's given us, the people of God, the spirit of God, the word of God, these weapons work. These weapons destroy the darkness. And I know some of you, just like you said, Louis, are not believing this right now. You're watching us and you're thinking, easy for you to say, it isn't easy for me to say after 18 months of feeling like a Bible teacher that lost my faith in that moment, but I saw him deliver me from it. And he, he is more powerful. And that's what scripture tells us. And, and we just have to choose to believe it. Yeah, I was out of commission for four months of my life. And 
and in really in bad shape for a lot longer than that. But I mean, I was out for four months of life and I managed the day okay. And okay would probably be a stretch, but I dreaded the night. Every yeah. night when I laid down and went to sleep, I dreaded it because I knew for me it was two o'clock and I knew 2 a.m. was coming and I was gonna feel like- Louie, that's 3 a.m. my time. Yeah. That's <laughs> I was going to feel like a blanket of suffoc the witching hour. <laughs> a, of suffocation, you know, was coming and I just couldn't deal. Yeah. And a lot of nights I'd be like, I'd really rather just stay up all night and be miserable than to go to sleep for two hours, three hours, whatever it was. And then it was an instantaneous waking up to um, a cloud of doom. That's the word I would put around it. It was just wow. doom. Like this is the end of everything. No more life, no more ministry, no more normality, no more light. And I, I know that in that moment, God's word came to me. And I tell this story that at um, pre probably the breaking point, and I wasn't thinking about ending my life, but I was really, really, really desperate. Mm. And Shelly was asleep in the bed next to me and I just lifted my hands up to heaven. I said, God, I can't do this one more time. I can't do it one more day. I've, I've, I've been to two dozen doctors. I've been down every road you can go down. I've been prayed for. I've been anointed with oil. I've had the leaders of the church come. I mean, I've tried everything and I can't do this again. And the Spirit of God brought this verse from the depths of my soul that I had leaned on in another hard season of life about 20 years ago. And the verse is an odd verse, it's from Job, and it says, God gives songs in the night. And that verse just captivated me. And I said to God, if you'll give me a song, I'll sing it to you. I'll sing it to you right now. And you know, you would think having been around worship leaders like we had, I could have just sung How Great Is Our God or 10,000 <laughs> Reasons or something else, but I wasn't thinking that way and my mind wasn't working. And God gave me this little spontaneous song right then and there and just a verse. And I started singing it to him and I sang it to him all night that night, all night. It just kept singing it over and over and over. And Craig, I love what you said because people think when I tell that story that I'm gonna say, and when I woke up the next day, a miracle had occurred and depression and anxiety were gone. But when I woke up the next day, I was in about the same shape as I was in the day before. But when I went to bed the next night, I already had a song and I knew two o'clock was coming, but I was ready when it did. And for a little season there, it was cloud, song, cloud, song, cloud, song, but then it became song, cloud, song, cloud, song, cloud, and then it became song, 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 cloud, song, 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 cloud. And I think it's just getting prepared. It's, it's understanding we're in a fight. It's getting a strategy and understanding that it's a process and that you don't sometimes see an overnight change. So Craig, they're saying in science now, it's like 60 something days to create a new thought to create a new habit. And talk about the process a little bit and what people really need to lean into if they wanna create that new neuro pathway that you're talking about. Yeah, well, I, I love your honesty. I think that's gonna you know, really help a lot of people because sometimes I do think, unfortunately, even though we have great intentions in the church, we say, you know, here's the truth. And now we think it's all, it, it just takes care of itself immediately. And I think we all know that it, that it takes a little more than that. I like the way you defined it. And that is that, that you are entering into a battle. And Jenny, you talked about the reality. You know, here you were doing a lot and you didn't even recognize that you were in a spiritual battle. And you would think that that would be like the first thing we would all recognize. And so I, I do wanna echo on what, what Louis said earlier. For anyone who's watching right now and you think this isn't gonna work for me, I've tried it, this is all just religious talk. Maybe just step back and, and ask yourself, could it be that you're in this place because you're under attack? That you, you've got, your spiritual enemy is coming towards you. And so what do you do if you're under attack? Well, you're gonna, you're gonna devise a, a, both a plan of defense and a plan of offense. And that's what we need to do in, in the process, uh, the way the mind works. And um, Louis, you suggested it can take 60 days. Interestingly enough, I just did a, a real 
um, thorough research on how do you heal the mind from addictions to pornography. And that's more like, in pornography, it's more like a, a 90 to 120 days. And I taught this to our church of what, what actually goes through your, your mind. And I think healing from um, pornographic lust is very, very similar to healing from a lie of believing like I, I can never have a relationship or we're always gonna be broken our family or we're not educated so we can't make a difference or, or whatever it would be. And, and what happens is as you start to think a thought, you can have an immediate um, increase in the dopamine that's released in your brain. You have a positive um, moment, but the, the old tracks, the old neural pathways tend to absorb your thoughts and you easily slip back into points of um, depression, in the lust world, you fall back into feeling overwhelmed with lust and your body is being changed by the thoughts you think. If you're thinking the right thoughts, you're, re you're releasing the right chemicals. If you're thinking the wrong thoughts, you're typically releasing the wrong chemicals. And so you can go on not just a mental um, roller coaster, but your body follows you in a very physical roller coaster. So why am I feeling lethargic? Why am I feeling depressed? And when you understand how the renewing of the mind, it changes your life, it changes your life. It changes you holistically and physically. And so it, you know, I, I'm not an expert enough to teach on all that happens to your body, but when you do go and you research that, um, you can see, okay, I'm now, just like you said, now it's song, um, cloud, song, cloud, song, song, cloud, song, song, song. That's what you can kind of expect. You're, you're detoxing the lies. You're creating new neural pathways that are just, they're weaker pathways with truth. And the more you think them, the stronger those pathways become. And then the easier it is to stay off the old pathways. And then your body is adjusting to the right beliefs. Meaning now you're starting to have more of the good chemicals released, or the bad chemicals release, you start to stabilize. And then at some point you just become healthy. It's a little bit like, like weight loss. You go on a diet and you lose five pounds and then you gain two. And you go, and you feel like you're stuck for a long time. You, you have to eat the right thing, exercise the right way for a long period of time. Your body kind of does this and then you stabilize. And guess what, now, now you're healthy. Now you have good rhythms. Um, now, you're, now you're really, you're, you're fighting weight. That's what's gonna happen in your mind. We're gonna work on it. We might be all over the place a little bit. Eventually we're thinking truth, our body stabilizes, we're walking by the spirit of God and we're finding joy and peace, even though uh, it may be chaotic around us. So good. And I, I just wanna say again, and we're gonna say this a few times because I know people are jumping on and jumping off and we've got people from all over planet Earth, of course, leaning in with us right now. Three resources, we're basically giving them to you. I know they cost money, but trust me, when you add it all up, the way it works, we're, we're just trying to get things to you today. So it's Jenny's book, Get Out of Your Head. It's Craig's book, which is Winning the War in Your Mind. And it's my new book that's coming out next week, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. It's Time to Win the Battle of Your Mind. All three of these are 25 bucks. It's at passionresources.com. So go there, check it out. You'll find the bundle. Uh, you can also get just my book for $10 there uh, if you use the hashtag no seat. And if you want to send a question in, we would love to feel that. We got a question. I want to pitch it to you guys. It's an interesting question. It says, how do you distinguish between thoughts that are better not to give energy to and thoughts that you need to engage with to realign them with truth? That's from Mansa. Anybody want to take a shot at that? That's a great question because I tend to push away negative thoughts. That's kind of my personality. I don't want to dwell on negative things. And yet that has been a problem in my life as well because God does use the difficulties in our life to unearth sometimes things we need to learn. And, and I love what both of you are saying, which is you didn't run from that season. And, and I've walked through season with anxiety where I had to get some counseling and, and walk through that and, and face it, right? And, and I think what we've got to realize is that strongholds are, are something that is binding us, that we are, we're paralyzed, right? That we can't go any further. And we need to pay attention to that. And we need to do the work around those things so that we can live more free, so that other people can be set free for our lives. One day, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're gonna go to heaven and, and you are gonna be whole and well and the tears will be dry. So we know there's a day coming where everything's gonna be made right. In the meantime here, it's our job to throw off the sin and the weight, Hebrews says, 
the sin and the weight. Sometimes it's sin and sometimes it's like depression and anxiety and doubt. I don't think all of that was a sin when I walked through that for 18 months. I think some of it was just attack and, and now the sin was not bringing people into it, right? But it was a weight. It was just something that was holding me back and it changed my, my influence. In, those, in that year and a half to two years, I was not preaching as boldly because when I would, I felt insincere because in the back of my head, I was questioning, is this true? So God wanted me to turn to that place and do the business of, of that doubt and to bring it to him. And so I don't think we need to be so afraid of difficulty and, and negativity in our lives. We need to just confront it and say, is this from God? Is this a place where we can do business, where we can fight better and grow and, and mature? Because honestly, so much of my dependence on the Lord has come through suffering, right? It's come through things that are, are difficult, that if I had avoided them and not pressed into them, I wouldn't have healed. And I know y'all feel the same way. 2020 was the year of years, and if you weren't uh, struggling with mental health before that year, you probably were as a result of it. Yeah. And leaders are in bad shape right now. Every time I get to have, to have an honest conversation with a leader right now, I'm getting about the same thing, which is, I think I can sum up last year with a couple of words, I lost. It seemed like nothing was the right answer, no decision was the right decision. It was very hard to navigate a polarized world. And yes, we saw a lot of people come to know Jesus. In fact, I think probably more people heard the gospel uh, in the last 12 months than in the five years before that. And that's been a big win. But for leaders, they're tired, uh, they're beat down, they're depressed, they're struggling. I think a lot of uh, leaders, Craig, I think a lot of pastors have written their resignation letter, maybe literally, but definitely in their minds. And as soon as they can get their people back to uh, a more normalized world, they're going to be like, hey, I did my best. I hope you guys have a great future. I'm out. How, how do you think your book, your message, and where leaders currently are like today, trying to navigate the endemic that we're in, where, where, what do you think is um, a key step or two for them to, to make the right decision they need to make today? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and Louis, I'm seeing the same thing in virtually every leader in, in um, every sector. Obviously, you know, we're all in ministry and ministry changed so much in, in the last year. And, you know, if you did gain something in one area, you probably lost a lot in some other area. And the same is true in, in, for business leaders. There were winners and losers and those who lost, it was to no fault of their own, most of them just in the changing of the world and had massive losses and many went out of businesses. And then those that were lucky enough to be in a good field, they're dealing with all the challenges of the growth. And, and then when you step into the middle of culture and try to lead toward anything meaningful, it's impossible to get right right now. So what do we do as leaders? Uh, in so many ways, it really comes down to mindset, 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 mindset. And I would just say to leaders right now, you can't get it right, you won't get it right, so take the pressure off and just do what, do what you believe is right. And I, I can't tell you how many times Amy said this to me, like, should I say this, should I do this, should I step in the middle of this? And she's like, you're gonna have to answer to God and you're gonna have to sleep at night and you can't please them, so you, you know, your mindset needs to be do what you believe is right and trust God with the results. And so I've really tried to lock that into mindset. A couple of other things is like, um, let's take the church world. In most churches, depending on how long they've been reopened, uh, maybe 80% of their people are not showing up or maybe 50% are not showing back up or whatever. And so you feel like you have this massive loss. Well, what do you do? Most of the pastors I talked to said, we've got to rebuild the church. We've got to rebuild the church. We've got to rebuild the church. Well, it may never get back in that format to where it was in 2019. So if your goal is to rebuild what you had, you're going to lose for the rest of your life. And I don't want to wake up feeling like I'm losing for the rest of my life. So my mindset, Louis, is not rebuilding. I don't want to go back to what we had anyway. The world is different. We're not rebuilding. We are building. That's the same thing we were doing before. And that little shift in mindset takes me from the point of I'm failing every day and I gotta get back to something that may not even be achievable. It takes the pressure off. It says, we're just preaching the gospel and leading people to Christ. So I don't know how that would apply to someone who's watching right now and whatever you're doing. It might be, it might be in, in your marriage. It might be when you're trying to train your, your body physically. 
if you can, if you can lock in the right mindset that helps you know God is with me, he's for me, we're taking ground, it, ma it matters so much in sports. Uh, you can have equally talented people and th those with a better mindset tends to win more often. Your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. The question is, do you like the direction your thoughts are taking you? If not, let's find truth, let's adjust, let's grab a mindset that motivates us, that propels us, that helps us to have faith in God to follow Him. And so that's what I'm working on, my Ryan. It's, it's, a, it's a mind battle every day and I'm fighting for anything that kind of gives me the faith to say, yes, we're still taking ground and, and finding joy in that. You mentioned it a few times already, but it's the first two sentences of your book. And I like it when I can get a real sense of what a book's about in the first paragraph. And your book opens and you say, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Not just some of the thoughts, but the strongest thoughts. What we think shapes who we are. And I talk about it in Don't Give the Enemy a Seat, talking about eventually our thoughts become actions. Mm -hmm. And the strongest thought is gonna lead the way and become the action that's the outcome. So Jenny, talk about that just a little bit and talk about um, how, to, how to navigate that process of taking that thought and as you said, taking it captive. So we heard the text, you read it for us, we all have it in our story and in our books, but how do you actually take that thought captive and as the text says, make it obedient to Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do think that idea that, you know, all three of us have talked about, we all use this, right? And we looked at the science and it says the same things. And, and what I love is that we are talking about this more. And the, the thought that Proverbs is pretty clear, like as a man thinketh, so he is. And so what you're saying is, is biblical. This, is, this matters. And, and what I see over and over again is when I notice my thoughts, when I, when I jot them down, when I start to think about what I'm thinking about, that's the beginning. Because those 18 months, I didn't think about what I was thinking about and it was having a power over me and it began to take on a life of its own inside of me. And so we've got to notice what we're thinking about. The next thing I encourage people to do is to, to give that a theme. What is the theme of that? You see all these random thoughts, you know, science will tell us 9,000 to 60,000 thoughts we have in a day. So average that to 30,000 thoughts. That's a lot of thoughts. So we, we look for a theme. What is, what is the main thing we're worried about? And what's the fear that's underneath that? Psychiatry 101 says that all humans believe three lies. I am worthless, I am helpless, I am unlovable. And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, there's, there's way more than that. I believe like a hundred in a day. But, but one of the therapists that helped me with this said, hey, Jenny, every single fear you have pretty much goes down to one of those things. And, and so I think being able to give a theme to it, what is the lie that you're really believing? That's kind of the most, you know, the highest, um, getting the most attention, like you talk about Craig. And then, you know, let's start to fight that. And the way, the greatest way I've seen to do that is the word of God, but also confessing it to someone until we bring someone in. And God built us for community, right? He built us to depend on other people. I've talked a lot about that in this conversation because it was such a powerful force for me. Once I wasn't alone in the dark with the devil, I could see the truth better. I could fight better. And they fought for me. In fact, they, they prayed and they fasted for me. So we treated it like a spiritual war. They treated it that seriously. Seriously, and they gave up food for me. They gave up a day or two right. for me where they said, listen, fighting for you is, is, is the goal of these two days. And, and I just appreciate having people fight for me. And I think we're scared to say our deepest, darkest thing, the two, last 2%. But what all three of us are saying that lead things and have a lot on the line when we talk about our weakness, you know, it's a lot on the line for a Bible teacher to say, I almost became an atheist. But I really believe that all of us can say that last 2% because of Romans 8, 1, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, people ask a lot of times, so how would I know if the enemy is at my table? And it's interesting, Jenny, because I, I have five lies in here, but they're all tied into the same three you're talking about. And, I just say back to people, if uh, you have a voice telling you or a thought telling you it's better at another table than the table that God set before you. In other words, if I could get out of this marriage and get out of this situation, get out of this town and get over at that table, that would be where life's at. The enemy's at your table. I say, if you're hearing right now that you're not good enough, 
You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You didn't come from the right family. You don't have the right background. You're just not good enough. The enemy is at your table because the shepherd who prepared the table before you, he gave his life for you. So that's how much he loves you. If you're hearing that you're not going to make it through this season, the enemy is at your table. If you're hearing that you are surrounded and there's no way out for you, done. The enemy is at your table. And if you're hearing any of those lies, then God is right there. He's in the midst with you. And I love that. It says he prepares the table in the presence of our enemies. So right in the middle of the circumstance, the darkness, the hardship, he is in it with you. And like Jenny said, all you have to do is look up and see his face and start listening to his voice, locking onto his words and letting him be the one who creates the narrative. And Craig, you talked about in your book, I loved it at the end of a lot of the chapters, maybe all of them, but at the ones that I was focused in on, you would give people something to actually say out loud. And I want to talk about that for a minute because that can go weird in spiritual culture when we start talking back to the devil out loud or talking to God out loud or talking to anybody out loud. But I think it's helpful sometimes to say things, claim them out loud, name them. That's a lie. I see it and I bind it in the name and the power of Jesus. I want to choose to take authority over that lie in Jesus' name. And you've got us reading things out loud. You want to encourage us to read them to ourselves, declare them over ourselves out loud. Why is it important that we use our voice as we're changing our mind? Well, I, I, I think maybe we went to the same church at some point in our life because it does get weird sometimes. I've been around you know, people who they can, they, they can get kind of weird. And so I want to acknowledge that but putting the weird stuff beside, if, if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, then you can, you can read the word and that's powerful. And then you might, you might say it and it might be powerful in a different way. And so what I wanna do, um, and if, if we're in kind of a holistic war, if the spiritual enemy is attacking every part, I don't wanna just think something, I wanna think it, I wanna give life to it. And then I wanna hear myself say it, I wanna see myself say it. Even if I'm thinking a thought, like if I'm thinking, you know, um, the power of God is with me and his Holy Spirit dwell. If I'm just thinking that I might be here, but if I'm saying it, my posture is gonna, gonna change. The power, my stance is gonna change. And so I want every part of my being to be consistent with the truth of God that's starting in my mind and is coming, uh, coming out in, in my mouth. And then I also want people around me who are saying the same truth. And both of you, um, really, you know, talked a little bit about this. Jenny, you mentioned confession. I think as Christians, we tend to forget there's, there's really a couple of types of confession that help change, change us. And we typically, I, for years, I only thought of one. If you confess your sins to God, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So we confess to God for forgiveness, but there's another type of confession and that's to people. And we confess to people for healing. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you might be healed. So I wanna say truth around others. I want other godly people saying truth around me. Um, for some of you right now, if you, if you really feel like you're stuck in, in unhealthy thought patterns, I would ask, I would ask you, who, who are the voices that you're listening to? If you've got the wrong voices speaking into your life and you're hearing that, then maybe change those voices. Um, if there's a truth you wanna believe, um, maybe consider not just thinking it, but declaring it. Uh, if it, with the, there's power in the spoken word, and then again, that helps drive your thoughts, um, new neural pathways even deeper. And so it's, to me, again, it's like, it's full body combat. It's every part of me, I want God renewing and changing. Uh, uh, the mouth, in the mouth is the power of life and death. Both of those are in the tongue. And it's amazing to think that we can speak out that narrative. And, you know, Jenny, it's funny. Uh, it's not funny, but it's really sad. But the way you know that you're believing one of these lies is just by listening to what you're telling people. And so if somebody says, hey, how are you doing right now? And your answer is, man, not good. I don't think I'm going to make it through this. I mean, I'm not sure I'm going to make it through this, this series of events or through this prognosis or through this uh, season in, at work or this, I don't think my marriage is going to make it. I don't think I'm going to make it. And when, when I hear myself say that, where did I hear that? 
Oh. Well, my shepherds surely didn't tell me I wasn't going to make it. There's not been a day in my life that I looked to my heavenly father and he said, Louis, I got news for you, man. You're not going to make it through this one. And so I learned like a little technique in my journal of speaking and writing. And both of you encourage a lot of writing. And I would just write down the, the lie. Like, for example, I'm not going to make it through this. And then I would cross it out and write a truth above it. And the truth I wrote above it was, I've made it through everything I've gone through in life. Mm. That's a pretty big shift. And so therefore, I have a new thought and a new summary. And the new summary is, I'm most likely going to make it through this because the odds are 100% in my favor so far that God has brought me through every trial I've faced in my life. So my new narrative where my old narrative was, I don't know if I'm gonna make it, my new narrative has now become, by God's grace, I'm gonna make it. Thanks for asking, it's really hard right now, but this is the main story, I'm going to make it. And all that requires is just a little work and a little observation, a little confrontation, and it requires us being committed to the process, and a lot of us just are stuck in that moment of saying things like, well, my mom was a worrier, my grandmother was a worrier, therefore our family's always been worriers, and that's why I worry. So just get used to it. That's me. Uh, We got a question, and I'm going to let you guys take a swing at this. Uh, Someone asked, at what point did you feel like you were ready to open up and talk about your battle with anxiety or depression for the sake of helping other people? That came from Jeremy. I, I would say for me, uh, it's kind of crazy, but it was, it was right in the middle of it. And so part of my anxiety, is, it sounds silly to most people, but I, we, we named it content anxiety. After 30 years of preaching, uh, you know, you tend to, how do I say similar things in new creative ways? And so I felt a lot of pressure. And oddly enough, Louis, I know you're friends with Pastor Stephen Furtick. I was at his house and we were, you know, I was just stuck in this, I can't, come up with um, a new message series. It was like way late. I never, it was never late for a deadline. And uh, he said, I'm just, I'm, I got so much anxiety. And he said, there's your message series right there. Just yeah. go into what you're, what you're facing. And so that's, that's for me is what I, is I recognized that sometimes the most powerful um, story of God's work is in the middle of God's work. Not just in the, hey, 20 years ago, here was my deal, but in the middle of it. And so I, I would encourage you know, other, other people right now that if you're in the middle of it, don't wait till you're out of it to open up. Now's the time that not only can you help others by opening up, but it also helps you to verbally process where you are, how you need God, how you're learning to depend on him, what he's saying to you, what he's showing you, how he's comforting you, how he's strengthening you. So there may be healing for others in your transparency and there also may be healing for you. Jenny, you want to add anything to that? No, I just love this conversation. I'm actually going to take it a different direction because what I love about this is we're three leaders largely on the conservative side of the church, right? But we're talking about the devil and we're talking about naming stuff out loud. And I just think this is a moment for the church to really tie together spirit and truth and authenticity that that as leaders, if there's a plea we would be making for you in this season, it is do not be alone in the dark with the devil. Like this is not okay and that he's coming for us and we're at war. And I do think there is so much on the line as I think about both of you being such leaders that I respect, that so many of us respect, and yet the enemy has come for you in such obvious big ways. And and I think about too where we sit in history right now and the, the chance that a lot of the things that need to happen before Jesus come back, comes back have happened now. And so there is this sense of we're preparing the church and this is kind of the last frontier, like this, the recesses of our mind where we haven't done war, where we've just let everybody sit there and we haven't talked about it a lot. So just even this conversation is so inspiring to me because I do think you all being so candid about your struggles, it's gonna help a lot of other people that may not have felt permission to talk about lust and talk about the things that they're thinking about and struggling with in a really authentic way. So maybe just that I'm smiling really big and and hopeful for the church. 
Yeah, and I think it's important to keep saying that. I, I know that when I started talking about this, the very first time I did, we were planning a church, Shelley and myself, and a handful of about 20 people, and it's, uh, I don't know, maybe that's what was the final straw in the whole thing, uh, part of that, but um, we were meeting in some people's living room, and Shelly was driving, and I was in the passenger seat literally shaking as we were driving to this little bitty cell meeting for this church that hadn't even come to life yet. And I didn't want to go that night. I just wanted to tell Shelly, tell him I'm not feeling good. Uh, But I just decided to go anyway. And I walked in and I sat down and here were 25 people that I was their pastor and we were going to plant a church. And I said, guys, look at me. I'm your pastor and I'm a mess. And I mean, I literally was trembling, but not because I was nervous, but because my body was kind of freaked out at that season in that moment. And it's so funny, and I won't tell the whole story right now, but um, another person spoke up and said, you know, it's weird since we don't have church now. I went to this other church today, and they had a guest person who showed up there, and they randomly spoke on this verse, and they said the verse, and it was like God just dropped hope into my heart. And there I was in horrible shape. And so... I, I came out of that, went on this big tour uh, where we were in basketball arenas every night, and I was telling this story about my depression. And then when that ended, I kind of thought, you know, okay, I did that, I did my part, I want to move on from that because I'm a guy and guys don't want to be weak, so I got to move on. But I think it's important for everybody watching today, and I'll just speak for me to know that these books are not about, hey, we, we smoked anxiety and we put it in the dust and it's no longer a part of our story. Um, these books are about the promises of God. They're about the truth of God. They're about applying God's word. They're about taking seriously the stewardship that we have of our minds. And it's something that I'm still in every day. Anxiety doesn't control my life every day. But Craig, this is so funny. The other day I walked out of my office and I would just gotten, you know, the book in for the first time. And I don't know about you, but I get it in and I pull out your, your book, which looks amazing, by the way. It's just like the coolest looking, most awesome book ever. And I put mine up next to it and I'm like, man, I'm an inch shorter than Craig. <laughs> and I'm about a half inch, you know, skinnier. And my cover isn't got a dust cover on it. And I literally, this is truth, and I'm sorry that I have to be, you know, so um, remedial, but I walked out of my office and I thought, nobody's going to be helped by this book. Mm -hmm. I just wrote a book called Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table, and I just had the thought, nobody's going to want to read this book. And nobody's going to like it. That's a, that's a lie. It, <laughs> we didn't it's a lie. It. Your it is book a lie. is powerful. <laughs> and so I'm asking, did either of you at any point when you finished writing these books have a thought, I don't even oh. know if this book's going to help anybody. That, that's why oh. I put Jenny's down and did not read it until I was through <laughs> with it. Because like, I'm not going to read this book. I'll quit writing mine if I do. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I mean, I was reading the audio book, which y'all know is just about the last thing you do in the process of writing. And you're reading it out loud and I had to sit there and read it, you know, every line. And I was embarrassed because I had put my whole soul out there and I thought, this is, this is too much. My editor even called me and said, Jenny, are you sure you want to go public with this? Like, this is, this is pretty dark stuff. And I had this fear and just paralyzed, like, this could ruin me. Like, just... And it didn't feel good enough. I mean, I, I read it and, and it was interesting. The team that was recording the audio, none of them are Christians. And they would even make kind of snide comments to me as, as I was reading it. And, and so, yes, I, I feel like we all three picked a fight with the devil specifically on this topic. In fact, this is the first interview I've ever done that there hasn't been some technical difficulty with, with because I think the enemy absolutely hates that, that we're saying no more. Like we're not gonna allow this to be a place where you're fighting alone. Like we're gonna come beside you. Like I picture those three books, Louie, and, and knowing both of you that, that this is us as a team saying, hey, we're gonna fight for you. Like we, we've been there and we've been pinned down by the devil and not fought back and experienced that. And this is us kind of rising up and saying, hey, because of this book and because of our God, like we're gonna fight for you. And so, yes, I do think there has been more insecurity around this project than I've ever had around another project. Yeah, I got ready to come to church a few weeks ago, and I was so uh, under 
attack all the way from my house to the building, and I was like, this message, this message, this message. And then, you know, the Lord just brought this word to me from a soap that I'd been doing, and it was him saying to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I am with you. And I took that for the whole day. I must have quoted that verse over my life a hundred times that Sunday. As I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. And that became my attitude, not just my verse for the day, it became the attitude that sort of brought up the fight in me to go and lead the way God had called me to lead. And so I'm just saying that so that we're all on the same page in this conversation. And you're not sitting on the other side of the screen going, you know, I can't relate to these guys because I'm in a different spot. We're all in the exact same spot, the same access to the same spirit, the same word, the same truth, the same victory that Christ has already won for all of us. And we have that same mandate that Craig talked about. You can renew your mind and you can change the way you think. So I want to close out, Craig, with you giving your, what you do best, which is um, just helping us know what to do right now as leaders, whether that's a family or leading a business or leading a church or leading a nation. What's the game plan for right this minute? And Jenny, I want you um, to give us the Jenny Allen shrunk down exhortational word for the day right now, because I know that's what your heart is all about. So before you do that, I'm going to say one last time, all of these books, okay? Jenny's book, Get Out of Your Head, Craig's book, um, which is powerful and amazing, Winning the War in Your Mind, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table, comes out on May the 11th. All these are for $25 today for about one more hour. I uh, feel like QVC when I said that, but uh, passionresources.com, all three books for 25 bucks, and um, our new book is $10 if you use the hashtag no seat, and I'm grateful for you. Jenny, I'm going to let you go first, and I'm going to let yeah. Craig have the last word. Well, this is it. I'll make it really simple. We have a choice. We have a choice, and Romans 8 lays it out, and it says, hey, there's, there's two ways to go. You can live in sin and death and towards it, or you can live in life and peace. And what you set your mind on, you set your mind on the spirit, you go towards life and peace, you set your mind on the flesh and you're gonna go towards sin and death. And what we're saying is biblical. You're right, it's not self-help. There is a way to change our minds. And, and it's that interruption where we don't just allow ourselves to spiral, but we interrupt it with God's word, with God's people, and believing God's spirit that he can change us. So powerful. Thank you both for your, your messages and, and your ministry and your friendship. You guys have helped me and Amy loves you, Jenny, so much. She loved her time with you recently. Um, and Lou, you, you asked me to talk just for a moment on leadership. And I would just say to um, everyone watching right now, I hope that you internalize and embrace that you're absolutely and completely a leader. You might say, you know, but I don't have a title or a position and leadership is never title and position. Leadership is mindset. Leadership's not something that we do. A leader is who you are. What is leadership? Leadership is influence and you absolutely and completely have influence. Because you're a leader, don't let the influences of this world lead you. You're not a victim to your thoughts. You're not a victim to your past. You lead yourself toward godly truth. If there's any thought that is inconsistent with God's word, you grab that thought you take it captive, you make it obedient to Christ, you lead yourself toward the truth of God, you'll find that life and peace that Jenny was talking about. And then ultimately, why do we do it? It's not just so that we can be happier or be free of anxiety or not be depressed, but it's so that we can experience the goodness of the grace of God through Jesus and then make him known to other people. He is the son of God. He's the good shepherd that Louis talked about. He leads us beside still waters and he'll set that table before us with all of his blessings before our enemies. If your enemies are at your table, get them out of your table. Don't give the devil a seat at your table. And uh, we know that God is, his power is greater and you can find victory and freedom in Christ. Man, I just wanna honor you, Craig, and uh, Jenny and I both do. We both uh, look up to you so much and so many leaders around the world do. And you've helped me, you've helped our team. Shelly and I love you and Amy. And Jenny, thank you for being fierce and leading such a beautiful movement. Um, if has really been stunning. I know Shelly 
has been around from the very beginning, and she loves and respects you so much. We love you and Zach a lot, and thank you for your time today. I know everybody applauds you, and I've got an incredible team of people that no one has seen here in Atlanta. Craig has the same uh, where he is today. Jenny has a team around her today, so just hats off to everybody, Jenny, for the first non-technical glitched interview around winning the battle of your mind, and we thank you, all of you guys, for helping make it possible. Thanks for joining in with us. You'll be able to rewatch this conversation, share it with a friend. It's easy to do that on the link on Facebook, and you can watch it at the Passion City Church YouTube page as well. Hope that you'll share it with as many people as you think it'll help. But these resources, I guarantee you, if you dive into them along with the Word of God, that you are going to see a change in your life. It won't happen overnight, but nothing happens overnight. But if you commit to it, God will change the way you think, and your mind will start becoming a garden filled with all kinds of amazing things like he asks us to think about, things that are lovely, things that are pure, things that are good, things that are praiseworthy, things that are honorable, things that are of good report. This is what God gave us to do, to use this mind uncluttered by negativity to create the future for his glory. So you've got a part in that. And I hope today encouraged you. We're honored that you took time to join us today. And we'll see you next time.